I'm John Major, uh, Director of Actuarial Research at Guy Carpenter, and uh, I've organized this shindig. I'm very grateful to these participants putting in all the work they did. I'm going to uh, start off with a picture that was made uh, popular by Kevin O'Donnell. It corresponds the uh, liability stack of a company with the losses, and his point was to try and say that the uh, policyholders are uh, are actually providing capital, but I'm going to turn it around and look at it from the investor's point of view. So this is the, the pecking order in which money is picked up to pay for losses. Now, so we start out with the reserves in a, in a multi-year model. Reserves would be looking backwards at previous years. and In a single-year model, it's, it, we're really just talking about the premium that's collected to pay for the losses. And then if the losses turn out to be high enough, then we start tapping into the shareholder equity that they're going to have to lose some money that year and to help pay for, for losses. And then eventually, uh, if things really go south, they preferred shareholders. And then uh, beyond that, uh, well, sorry, your debt holders aren't going to get uh, what you expected. And then beyond that, there's the no man's land of uh, bailouts and uh, shareholder, uh, the uh, policyholder put and whatnot. Um, but uh, I, want to, I want to focus on this boundary between the reserves and equity and uh, try and convince you that it's kind of artificial. And I want to try and get you to think of it in a different way. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to think of uh, isolating all this money into these little pots or layers, if you want to use an insurance term, or tranches, if you want to use an investment banking term. But these little pots of money, and, and they're in sequence. The first loss that comes in is going to get paid out of the first pot, and then when that gets used up, then we're going to start taking out of the second pot, et cetera, et cetera. So now, so we have some of these pots are in the reserves, and some of them are in equity. And think about it. Now, look at that last pot under reserves on the, on the right there. If loss experience comes in favorable at the end of the year, what's going to happen to that pot of money? It's going to go to the shareholders. So uh, it actually ends up being equity. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the first equity pot, if loss experience is adverse, then, uh, oh golly, that's no longer equity, now that's going to pay losses. So really, uh, so what, what is going to be paying losses and what is going to belong to the shareholders at the end of the day isn't known until the end of, end of the day, the end of the year. Uh, ahead of time, it's really an educated guess. It's an estimate. But really, what's an estimate? It's an educated guess. I want to think of this differently. I want to erase that boundary. I want to think of all of this money, all of these assets available to pay losses, is that they belong to the shareholder, but the shareholder has agreed to pay losses out of those funds. Okay. Now, the shareholder is looking at these different pots of money and saying, and what, what are these worth to me? If I got a, I got a pot, I got a pot in the middle there, $100, is that worth $100 to me? Well, no, because there's a material probability I'm not going to get that back at the end of the year. So it's worth less than $100. So what is it worth? Well, that's, that's what our distortion function is, is all about. The distortion function tells us that I have a certain probability that, I'm going, I, that I either am or am not going to get that pot of money at the end of the year. And so I need G of S uh, to be funded from the policyholders, and I'll put in the rest, the 1 minus G of S. That's what it's worth to me. It's the 1 minus G of S. That's what it's worth to me. And then we add them up, and we have the entire required premium. But now I, I want to draw the boundary between the reserves and equity this way. See, way off to the left, almost surely the investors are not going to get that money back. So most of that has to be funded by the policyholders. And then over on the right, we have a, a pretty high probability that they are going to get the money back. So the shareholders are going to fund most of that and not require an awful lot of money from the policyholders. So we have this alternate view of, uh, of how we divvy up the funds between the investor contributions and the policyholder contributions. So all we need is a distortion function now, right? right. Okay, so this is a good news, bad news situation. Good news is, over on the right-hand tail, we have lots of market price data, uh, you know, a lot of activity in the market for 
cap bonds for excessive loss, you know, you know reinsurance. Uh, you know, typically anything with an exceedance probability under 20% or better, under 10%, then you're going to find something out there that, uh, that you can make sense of. The bad news is that for the rest of the distribution, the other 80 plus percent of the time, crickets. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we're going to think like investors. So let's go back to that pot of money there. So ahead of time, this pot is getting funded, this tranche is getting funded, G of S is coming from the policyholders, and one minus G of S from the shareholders. And then in the end, it's either all going to the policyholders or all going to the shareholders, but in expectation, we're expecting S of it to go to the policyholders and one minus S to the shareholders. So let's focus on the shareholders' perspective. He's got an, an expected profit of what comes out minus what comes in, and that's G of S minus S. And going back to Steve's diagrams, that's the, the distance between the diagonal line and the G of S function. Coming in, what the shareholder supplies, that's his investment, okay? So we have the investment, we have the expected profit, what's natural to do, take the ratio. The expected return on investment, or ROE. And if this is a requirement, we can also call this the cost of capital. And this is how investors think. They think about this quantity here. So the upshot of this is that we have two ways of talking about this. We can talk about distorted probabilities, which is how we talk amongst ourselves as actuaries and statisticians when we're comfortable with the idea of distorting prob probabilities. But if you're going to go talk to your CFO, maybe you'll want to talk in terms of ROE. And we'll also see in just a couple of minutes that ROE is a, is a fresh perspective for all of this. So part two. Uh, if, uh, if you were around yesterday, you saw uh, the empirical data. We had some market price data. Uh, and here it is in the uh, blue dots. And Jesse used these in interpolating from zero, zero to the first blue dot, and then between the dots, and then from the last one to one, one. And that created what we were using as a distortion function. Technically, it wasn't because it's not perfectly concave, but nonetheless, you can still run the numbers on it and get numbers out. And what we did is we fit a whole bunch of parametric functions to these. And so the solid black line is this piecewise linear, we're calling it, that we used yesterday. Uh, the uh, dashed line is just a linear function, straight line, uh, capped at the top, uh, jumped to zero at the bottom. Uh, dotted line is the T-bar. Uh, we, we, we calibrated the, the T-bar threshold, so it would be the best least squares fit to this. this is all least squares fitting to the uh, predicted rate on line. Uh, the solid red is the log linear, which generalizes the dashed red, which is the proportional hazards. Uh, then we have a solid green and a dashed green. The dashed green is the Wang transform. The solid green is the Wang transform, where the outer function is the, uh, the T distribution rather than the normal distribution. I covered and mentioned this yesterday. Uh, and then finally, we have this yellow line, uh, which is uh, our linear yield uh, distortion function. And uh, I'll spend some time explaining that later. But for now, we'll just treat it like the, the mystery curve here. Uh, so this is, uh, now notice this only goes up to like, you know, 12% or so. And they're, they're doing a pretty good job, mostly, of, of fitting here. Uh, not bad. Uh, let's take a look at the low end. We'll shift to a log-log scale so we can get a better look at what's happening at the low end. Uh, most of these are do, uh, doing ever decreasing rate online. They're all going to zero uh, at some rate or another. But two of them seem to be going down to a minimum rate online, which, uh, which might be a feature we like. We might want our distortion functions to, to end up with a minimum rate online, because that seems to be what happens in the marketplace. Uh, now, that doesn't immediately discard the other ones from consideration because you can fix them. You know, you can put a floor on them uh, this way. And so there you go. There's, uh, you know, any of them you want can exhibit uh, a, a minimum rate online. It's not a problem. But let's zoom out now. We'll go back to the arithmetic scales and zoom out to the full zero to one. This is where we have a problem. Yeah. Our, our data is running out at 12.5%. And the solid black line just went, okay, we're going to do a straight shot to 1-1. One, one. 
And all of these other ones are best fitting to the data. It's like the tail wagging the dog here. They're all over the place in terms of the body of the distribution. And we have no data, uh, at least I'm not offering you any data, to, uh, to say what is reasonable there. So you know, how on earth can we make sense out of which of these are reasonable and which aren't? Well, let's look at it from the perspective of return on equity. So let's, let's go back to this, and we have a generic uh, distortion function, and recall, uh, uh, we're gonna take a particular tranche there, S, we have our expected loss goes up to the diagonal, our rate on line given by our G of S goes up to the red line. The gap between them is our, the expected profit, and then the remaining gap to the top is the investment, and the ratio is the ROA, okay? So, let's look at some of these measures in terms of their behavior on this ROE. Now, here are the three that go up to one and then flatline. T-bar, the linear, which ends up looking a lot like a T-bar, except it has a, a jump of zero. Uh, and then the, uh, the log linear has a curve, a gentle curve, but then it also gets capped. Now, for all of these, when it gets to the point where it's maxed out, the investment portion of this is one minus G of S is zero. There's no investment. And yet, there is still an expected profit. So if you're interpreting it in these terms, you know, these tranches over on the right, these are supposed to be fully funded by the policyholder, and yet uh, the investor still has a positive expectation of getting some of this money back. That is the definition of an arbitrage. No money at risk and a possibility of a return. Isn't that, that's not kosher, <laughs> it's, not, it's not suitable. Uh, now I'm gonna go off script here for a minute, uh, a little rant. Uh, some points that were made yesterday that I think need to be emphasized. Yesterday, uh, and I, I wish we had mentioned it today, but yesterday we saw that there are really two purposes for these risk measures. There's a regulatory-driven purpose or a solvency-driven purpose that says, how much money do we need backing these? The pricing is how are these funds going to be divided between the policyholder contribution and the investor contribution? These are distinctly different questions, okay? If you look at T-bar there, from a regulatory perspective, this makes perfect sense. It says all of these tranches, you know, let's take a 95 T-bar, all of the scenarios, all of the tranches that have uh, more than a 5% chance of being hit, we want them to be fully funded fully collateralized. We want all the money there for them. Now, from a regulatory and solvency perspective, that makes perfect sense. But if you're going to use that measure to say, okay, now how do we divide it between the policyholder and the investor? It doesn't make sense. Okay? That it's not suitable for that purpose. Now, here's, here's where the rant starts. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are allocating capital, Gary Venter has asked this question many years ago, why are you allocating capital? You probably shouldn't be allocating capital. Why are you allocating it? If you, if you think about it, you, what you're really doing is you're trying to allocate the, some cost of capital. Uh, and maybe the mechanism you're using, maybe you can just insert cost of in front of capital, wherever the word capital appears, and maybe the logic still works. But if you're using TVAR, I'll be polite and say that's inappropriate, or I'll, I'll speak from the heart and say that's nonsense. You, you, you should not be allocating your costs, your risk measures to lines of business by using TVAR. It, it just doesn't make sense. And this came as a revelation to us recently. Uh, I, I spent years with Gary Venter. Oh, allocation needs to be marginal. Uh, you know, it gets you into the co-measures, uh, all this logic, and so so we get into co-TVAR and things like that. And it's like, but wait a minute, <laughs> you know, the marginal stuff, the co-measure stuff, that all makes perfect sense. But but who said TVAR makes sense to for this purpose? And, and I submit to you, it does not. It does not make sense. And and my apologies for helping to promulgate this con massive confusion. I, I think we need a big reset on this. Well, I'll get off my soapbox now and get back to the story here. So with these, with these things that clip up, if you just draw them on where the vertical axis is, return on equity, you can see there, 
they're zooming up, they're diverging, uh, and that, that's a problem.